topic two of three, harvesting. So harvesting investment means assets can be transferred to investors. So uh, if, if a company you invest in goes public uh, or sells itself to another company, that's basically a way of harvesting the asset uh, and you get money or return your investment. So a company, again, can be sold for cash and the cash is distributed to shareholders or a company goes public. And after an IPO, uh, shares are distributed to uh, venture capital firms or private investors. Uh, six months after IPO, and that's why sometimes you see uh, a company stock price decline a lot six months after IPO, which is usually a buying opportunity, uh, and that's called the IPO lockup. Okay, planning and exit strategy. Uh, you have to explain liquidity targets to investors when you're raising capital, and we kind of covered this early on. Uh, otherwise, what happens is um, trauma occurs uh, when investors um, have their own personal liquidity needs, right? Uh, and um, you know, an easy way to, to value them is, is using relative multiples. And we already covered valuation before. Uh, but make sure that your investors and your company understand that you're both thinking the same way in terms of when the harvest is going to occur. Otherwise, litigation could occur. You always want to have a lawyer prepare all of your legal documents whenever dealing with potential investors because all is well when they first invest, uh, but um, they have their own personal liquidity issues sometimes, uh, which is unfortunate. So make sure you're on the same page before they invest. Uh, highlight all the risks, of course. Buyouts. Okay, so let's talk quickly about leverage buyouts or LBOs. Okay, I'm sure you've heard the term before. Uh, basically, this is a buyout of a company uh, using debt, right? So you've got to have amazing cash flows first, though, in order to secure the loans, right? And that's called a leverage buyout, okay? And what happens is many public companies will partner with amazing private equity firms and go private if they're worth more private than public. Uh, and firms like KKR or TPG can help. And these are fantastic firms that have had incredible success helping take companies private. Okay, uh, and the goal, of course, is to go public again and harvest that asset again at some point in the future, right? Uh, and so if management drives a buyout, it's not called an LBO, it's actually called an MBO, which stands for management buyout, okay? And this took place with Nabisco in the 1980s uh, with the help of KKR, which is an amazing, again, private equity firm. Uh, I remember Henry Kravis, uh, who is the first K in KKR, he came and he guest lectured at my business school. Uh, he also went to Columbia. And we were so excited to see him talk about leverage buyouts and Nabisco and that amazing book called Barbarians at the Gate, which you have to read, which explains how KKR took Nabisco private in the, um, in the 80s. But Henry Kravis actually didn't talk about deals at all when he presented to us. And I, I gained a lot of respect for him. He stood there for an hour and he talked to us about giving your time uh, to charities. Not just your money, but your time. Uh, and um, I thought that was very prophetic and, and I gained a lot of respect for him at that point. Okay, so KKR, Henry Kravis is the top dude there. And let's talk about LBOs uh, in, in action, okay? So he was actually the one that made a fortune uh, taking uh, Nabisco private uh, back in 1989 or so. Uh, and again, I want to stress, you've got to read that book, Barbarians at the Gate, if you want to learn more uh, about, uh, about private equity because it is a fascinating turn of events. Uh, he basically invented the market. Um, and there's a lot of great resources on YouTube. You can search for Henry Kravis. There's a great interview with John Mack, who's the awesome former CEO of Morgan Stanley on this topic. Okay, let's move on to ESOPs, ESOPs. And that stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plans. And basically, this is when employees buy the company using leverage, okay, using loans, right? Uh, and it's owned by all the employees and not just management, okay? IPO, we talked about at length. Uh, but I want to talk about a couple terms when it comes to IPOs or initial public offerings. Primary shares are shares in an IPO, meaning new shares, okay? So the firm gets the money, right? And so when we took our company public early on, we actually, um, in this hypothetical class environment, when Goldman Sachs was our banker, uh, we actually sold a combination of primary shares and secondary shares. 
Primary shares means the company gets money, right, which they can use to help grow their business. And there's also secondary shares. And this is where you and our employees got very rich. Um, and secondary shares in an IPO means existing shares are sold. I mean, the venture capital firm uh, can, can, can get money back, uh, uh, can sell, um, or, or employees that want to cash out uh, can get money as well. So part of your options uh, on, you know, in our company here, um, you were able to exercise them, so to speak, when the company went public. Okay, so the under, uh, underwriting spread in an IPO is usually the fee that bank, investment banks get, and it's usually up to 7%. It's lower than 7% now. Um, and to list on NASDAQ, um, you need the price to be at least four bucks. Um, you also all have to have over a million shares and been in business for a couple of years uh, and have a, a board of directors, et cetera. Remember before we talked about how corporate governance is much better for publicly traded companies or corporations than it is for sole proprietorships or LLCs or early stage companies. Okay, topic three of three. Troubled ventures and turnarounds. A lot of companies are walking dead out there. And can turnarounds work? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, more often than not, turnarounds don't work actually because the underlying company or industry is in secular decline. And so I'm a firm believer that turnarounds do not work in technology. And we're going to cover this topic at length in the final class, class number 15. Okay, turnarounds don't work in tech. Right? Only one turnaround tends to work in tech every decade. You know, in the 90s or the 80s, it, or in the 90s, it was, um, it was actually IBM. Um, and, and last decade, of course, it was Apple. But it's only because Steve Jobs, the founder, came back. Okay, so when a company is in secular decline, especially in technology, turnarounds don't work. Um, a, a great example of this is a company that's near and dear to my heart, being Canadian, which is uh, Research in Motion, the company that makes Blackberries. Once that company went into secular decline, it, it was over. And you had investors chasing the stock all the way down saying, oh my God, it's so cheap at nine times earnings. And then it was six times earnings. Oh my gosh, it's so cheap at six times. Those earnings numbers are off. When a company is in secular decline, earnings estimates continue to get cut. Turnarounds almost always in 99.9% .9 of situations do not work in technology. Okay. It's important not to be emotional uh, about, uh, about dying companies. Realize when it's walking dead, and then liquidate or sell it and just move on, okay? Um, it, it, don't be emotional about business. Uh, so more often than not that we talked about uh, these turnarounds not working, especially in tech. Um, as a result, what happens, uh, corporate raiders like to break apart companies, right? Um, and um, when companies are too cheap as well, these corporate raiders will come in or these activist investors like Carl Icahn will say, eBay, you're undervalued. Your PayPal assets worth more than eBay itself. Let's break it up. Okay. So an example is, is Hewlett Packard worth more dead than alive? And, and, th and that's a tough one because Hewlett Packard has some great assets. Hewlett Packard is actually the sixth biggest software company in the world because they did a lot of acquisitions over the years. However, Hewlett Packard's headquarter campus in, uh, in, in Palo Alto here in the Bay Area is worth $7 billion dollars just the property value. Tough call. Is it worth more dead or alive? We'll see. So the number one reason that ventures fail, you all know the reason. Uh, it's um, because cash is king uh, and they run out of cash. Let's talk quickly about financial distress. Uh, and this means when cash on hand is insufficient to pay for current liabilities. Okay, That's financial distress. Loan default. Um, miss one payment and it's over. That's why I don't want you to use banks. Okay, um, when you're an early stage company. If you're cash flow positive, it's okay to use, use debt, but be very careful. It's, it's like doing a deal with the devil. Be careful. Acceleration provision. This is where it gets scary. Um, this is when a firm defaults on just one payment and then all future payments are due immediately. Terrifying. Terrifying. Then there's something even worse called the cross default provision when dealing with banks. And this means that one late, late payment, one late payment on one loan causes every single loan to go into default, which is why I don't want you to use debt unless you have to, and it's a late stage company. And if you do, make sure your family is legally protected, okay? Have an LLC structure set up or some other structure that protects you. Foreclosure. Uh, this is a sad one. This is the, the legal process where lenders collect and take stuff from you. 
And this is one that's near and dear to my heart because, you know, LLC structures protect you um, and your family. And there is a picture you're, you're seeing here of, of my house I lived in when I was a kid. Uh, the house on the right is my house. I had a, a great childhood. There, there's four trees in the front lawns, uh, which my parents planted, which are for my older brother, Jamie, my little uh, sisters, Katie and Elizabeth. The house next to us was owned by a, a wonderful family. Uh, God, were they awesome. And they had two amazing kids. And they owned a couple of incredible Portuguese bakeries in Toronto. And um, I'll never forget this, but I came home one day. And um, my friends that lived there were, were sitting on the porch. And I said, is everything OK? Are you locked out? Do you want to come over to my house? And they said, there's a sign on the door from the sheriff. And they changed the locks, and we can't get in. And what happened was my neighbor, um, uh, the father uh, that owned these, uh, these, these awesome Portuguese bakeries, um, actually um, registered the company in his own name and default on a lot of loans. And as a result, the bank brought uh, the sheriff by and, uh, and repossessed their house. Tragic. Tragic. So please make sure to set up an LLC and protect your family. Okay, moving on. Insolvency. Uh, this is when your book equity goes negative. Remember on the balance sheet we talked about equity? That's the people that own your stuff, including yourself. That's when that goes negative. That's called insolvency. Um, now, 25% of companies go belly up within two years of being founded. Tragic. Uh, over 50% of companies are shut down within four years of being founded. Unbelievable. Um, so what is all this chapter this, chapter that stuff in bankruptcy law? It's really important. And um, it's one of the last topics we're going to talk about. So bankruptcy laws is basically a legal code that has many chapters that are amazing and protect you if you have to declare bankruptcy. And let me talk about this. There's chapter seven, which deals with how firms or people liquidate stuff. Chapter nine is how cities deal with bankruptcy. Uh, chapter 11 is how firms deal with bankruptcy. And chapter 12 is how firms deal with bankruptcy. Okay, so what about other chapters? Well, chapter one, three, and five are general bankruptcy rules, which are we don't really care much about. Um, there's other chapters um, that are less relevant in this course. So what we're going to do is, in this course, we're just going to talk about the two most important chapters, which are chapter seven, which is the process of liquidating stuff, and chapter 11, which is the process of restructuring your firm so that you can survive. Uh, and uh, this helps out tremendously well. So let's kick it off with chapter seven, liquidation, okay? So after a person or an entity or a company files for bankruptcy, then a court supervises the entire liquidation process. Chapter 11, bankruptcy filing temporarily protects a distressed firm so that they can restructure a payoff debt. This buys you time, okay? Now there's different types of restructuring you can do when you're in chapter 11. One is called operations restructuring, which basically means increase revenue or cut expenses, right? Simple. Another one is called asset restructuring, which means selling stuff to improve your liquidity ratios, like debt divided by equity. Uh, and there's also other ratios that you can improve, uh, like inventory ratios, and I'm not going to go into detail on other stuff. Then there's financial restructuring as well, which changes the terms on debt, like give me a little bit more time. Um, now, Chris... <laughs> This session is horribly depressing. Can you share some positive news, please? Yes, I can. Chapter 11 works. 65% of companies that file for Chapter 11 that are not fraudulent reorganize. 28% liquidate and 7% merge with another firm. So as long as you're not part of a fraudulent entity, you got a 65% chance of reorganizing. Right? Uh, and coming out on top. You got a 7% chance of merging with another firm. So that means you have a 72% chance of being okay. You've got a 28% chance of liquidity. It's amazing, isn't it? It's incredible. And so, Chris, this session is so interesting now. Can you please walk me through the chapter 11 steps? Sure. Okay, step one, okay, when, when you file for bankruptcy, right? And this is a good thing, it's important. When you file for chapter 11 bankruptcy, 
you file with one of 300 bankruptcy courts in the US that were set up in the late 1970s. Then a bankruptcy judge accepts or doesn't accept your petition, right? If it's fraud, they don't accept it. Um, then you've got 120 days or about four months. Uh, is that right? Four months? 3, 60, 90. Yeah, about that. Four months. That's right. Uh, to make a plan. You have four months to make a plan to come out of bankruptcy. Okay? And then 60 days is given to creditors to accept the plan. And most of the time, the creditors say, okay, right? Because they can't come after you anyway because you're protected for quite a while under bankruptcy protection, right? So they're either going to get nothing or something a little bit lower than what they expected. So most of them accept it. And then the investors vote. Okay. So debt sucks early on. I've covered this a lot. Banks don't give a damn. Uh, VC firms care more, <laughs> put more in brackets because uh, they've got an equity stake in your company, right? They're not loaning you money. Uh, and so raise as much money as you can when you can from equity investors, okay? Raise as much money as you can when you can from equity investors. Very important. It's almost impossible raising money during a recession or when rates are very high because who the heck's going to loan you money when rates are high and they can earn a great return on investment by leaving their money in the bank, right? So it's very tough, right? And sometimes things are really out of your control, right? There's a butterfly effect or a domino effect. Um, and, you know, one great example of this was in late 2008, early 2009 when the economy was imploding, the global economy that is, and Madoff. Um, scandal emerged. And what happened was so many people had billions of dollars invested with this guy, Bernard Madoff, and they had to redeem. Uh, and so everybody redeemed uh, on, on Wall Street and, and in many other areas of the world, uh, and it created this domino effect. Uh, and that's outside of our control. So, um, I mean, we should have known better. I mean, the guy's name was Madoff. Madoff. Bad joke, I'm sorry. Okay, so be careful with money uh, from family and friends as well. It's, it's kind of uncomfortable holiday or Thanksgiving conversations when your family asks you how their investment's doing. Um, anyway, all you have in business is your reputation and integrity. And often, this is interesting, the same investors will back you again, even if you weren't successful. This is true. If they trust you, they'll invest in you again. A great read on turnarounds is this book said who called <laughs> Who Says Elephants Can't Dance, uh, which is written by, by Lou Gerstner, who was the CEO from IBM. He used to work for McKinsey before. Great read. Okay, so here's a quick summary here. Uh, equity investors trump debt investors early on. We talked about additional ways to raise capital. Bankruptcy courts protect your business as you restructure as well. And that's it for this chapter. Thank you.